Buddha says there are three factors of the path that hover around all the other factors. There's right view, which helps you to know what's, say, right speech or wrong speech, right action, wrong action, right mindfulness, wrong mindfulness. And there's right mindfulness, which keeps in mind the fact that you want to develop skillful qualities and you want to abandon the unskillful ones. And then there's the actual effort, the right effort that actually does develop the skillful ones and abandons the unskillful ones. These things have to go together, because without right view and right mindfulness, your effort goes straying off in other directions. So as you put an effort into the practice, you have to understand it, understand what you're doing, why you're doing. And once you've got that understanding, you've got to keep it in mind, because otherwise the effort goes and fits and starts. It doesn't build up momentum. example, with right understanding. It's a series of images the Buddha gives of people who put a lot of energy into the practice, but they do it the wrong way, and they don't get results. And as a result, they get discouraged. They begin to wonder if effort can do anything at all. You have to remember there are a lot of people in the Buddha's time who said, you put effort in the practice and you don't get any results, regardless of how much you want them, because human effort is just too, too weak. Nowadays, you get the idea that any effort is going to get in the way of the unconditioned, so you have to stop exerting any effort at all. Just kind of sit out there and let the mind be like a big open sky with clouds floating in and floating out without you doing anything at all. But that wasn't the Buddha's approach. Instead, you have to understand where effort is best applied. It's like trying to get milk out of a cow. You twist the horn, you're not going to get any milk. You twist the horn more and more and more, put a lot of effort into twisting the horn, and it doesn't make any difference. You're still not going to get any milk. At that point, it's easy to get discouraged and think, well, maybe effort is not a good thing. The problem is not so much with effort in general, it's your misunderstanding of where to apply it. You pull out the udder, you get the milk. You don't have to pull hard, hard either. You put the effort in the right spot, and you're going to get results. And then you've got to keep that in mind. Because it's so easy as you're sitting here meditating, and you start focusing on the breath, and then you forget. You're off someplace else. Or you get distracted by something in the breath itself. Things get nice, things get comfortable. And as John Fung would say, you sort of let go with your hands and feet and just kind of fall into the pleasure. Forgetting that the pleasure has to come from causes. And if you abandon the causes, the pleasure is going to disappear after a while. That's something you have to watch out for. It's not just the distractions in the meditation that are going to be troublesome. Sometimes some of the good things come up. John Lee has a whole list of good things in the meditation. A lot of people meditate so they can get visions and want to see something. That's often one of the first questions you're asked in Thailand when people find out that you meditate. Ah, when you meditate, what do you see? Hoping that you've been seeing lottery numbers. or spirits of the dead, or whatever. That's a big distraction. Even the sense of rapture that can come in a meditation, that can be a distraction too. The sense of pleasure, ease, that can be overwhelming. If you see that coming along and you just reach out for it, you're going to miss 
everything. You're going to leave the breath, and your meditation will float around for a bit, and then you come out and wonder where you were. So this is why mindfulness is such an important part of the concentration. You've got to keep your breath in mind. If you're not focused directly on the breath, well, at least keep the fact that you're dealing with feelings and mind states, any one of the four frames of reference. And if you're going to focus on feelings, don't just wallow in the feeling. Remember, you're looking for the cause. So that takes you back to the breath on the one hand, and it takes you back to the steadiness of your gaze on the other. We've got to keep in mind the fact that this is work that we're doing here, even though it can be very pleasant. You don't want to be the sort of person who does a little bit of work and then gets your first salary check and then you disappear for a week. You go off and spend your money. And when you've run out of money, you have to come back and ask for the job again. If you keep this up, you're never going to get a raise. You have to realize that the progress comes by sticking with the breath in its various manifestations. If you're not sticking with the in-and-out breath, try to stay with a sense of breath energy suffusing the body. Make sure that every part of the body is nourished by that kind of energy. You stop twisting the, the cow's horn, but you actually put effort in. You're going to pull out the udder. Another image that Buddha gives is trying to get oil. But you grind gravel. The gravel doesn't have oil. All you get is gravel dust. If you want oil, you can grind sesame seeds or any plant that has oil. The same with the meditation. You've got to know where the effort has to be focused. You're focused on the steadiness of your gaze. You don't want to focus on anticipating things. I'm going to call this evening from someone who wouldn't know how long it was going to take to, to attain stream entry. And she was hoping it was in the matter of months. And as I told her, you can't focus on that. Where are you going to look for stream entry? You've got to look right here at your breath. As with any, any journey, you have to focus on where you're placing your feet. If you have an imaginary image of what the goal is going to look like, you can't walk on that image. The image is not going to take you there. It may motivate you, but the actual getting there has to be in watching where you're taking your step to make sure you're on course and that you're not going to step on something slippery and fall. So you focus the effort right here, and it's constantly coming back to the breath, to your frame of reference. And whatever comes up, you want to deal with it skillfully. This is what the frames of reference are all about. They're not just simply things that you watch coming and going and you don't do anything. I was reading a while back someone saying that there are basically two paths. One is the path of right mindfulness, the other path is right, the path of right effort. In the path of right mindfulness, you don't do anything. You just watch things arise and pass away and let them sort of sort themselves out. Whereas the path of effort, you put in a lot of effort to getting the skillful things to come and the unskillful things to go away. The idea being that the first path was the one that used more discernment and was wiser and easier. But I've never seen that path go anywhere. I've never seen the Buddha teach that path. For him, right mindfulness, right effort have to go together. You remember to apply right effort, and you remember where to apply it, because you've been learning lessons in your meditation, either from Dharma talks you've heard or from your own reading or your own practice. You learn your lessons, you try to keep them in mind so you can apply them. And then you gain a your own sense of touch as to how much you have to push. Sometimes you're very observant, but you don't do much, and you want to watch what's going on, especially when you can't figure something out, when all the different 
approaches you've applied in the past don't seem to work, and then just watch for a while. But when you have something that works, go ahead and do it. Because the frames of reference are there to remind you. These are the things you watch out for, and when you see them arise, remember there's a duty with regard to them. You've got the Four Noble Truths, and they're telling you, you do this. If you run into any stress or suffering, you want to comprehend it. If you can see what's giving rise to that stress, you want to let that go. And so the factors of the path, everything from right view to right concentration, those are things you're trying to give rise to if they're not there, and then you develop them. Now we begin to realize what the end of suffering is like. So there are duties with regard to everything that's listed there in the frames of reference. And you keep those frames of reference in mind so you can remember, oh, when sensual desire arises, that's something you want to abandon. And how do you do it in such a way that it's effective? When rapture arises, how do you develop that in a skillful way? When serenity arises, how do you develop that in a skillful way? When ill will or sloth and torpor arise, how do you abandon those things, not get sucked into them? So you maintain your mindfulness so you can remember what's the right thing to do right now, and then that's how you apply your effort. So you really do get the milk, you really do get the oil, because you're focusing your effort in the right place, and you're applying the right kind of effort to the right place.